that little southern draw i want to go to genesis chapter 4 verse 1 if we could new living translation as we take up our tithes and offering for the day i will say that we're going to start a building fund we mentioned it wednesday night um we've done a lot of work on the inside of the building and if you drive by the building or drive in the parking lot it still looks like 84 lumber from the outside so we want to start doing a little bit of work on the outside of the building, specifically in just changing the color. Get a good paint job on the building. So we're gonna repair some of the metal and uh, pay somebody to come in and paint that. That'd be one step towards getting it looking better. We had a good crew here yesterday and I just wanna say thanks to everybody that was here again yesterday. There was a lot of people here helping, talking about cleaning up the outside. We tore down 350 feet of fence on the backside over here Woo! yesterday. Cleaned up some brush. We've got little, little ways to go as far as the cleanup of the rest of that, but we're very grateful for everyone that showed up. So thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. Now Adam had sex with his wife, and she became pregnant. They gave birth to Cain. <clears throat> you, know, you guys know the story here. Cain and Abel. 
Abel was a shepherd. Cain, Cain cultivated the ground. And verse 3 says, I guess it's verse 3. The print on here is pretty small. <laughs> when it came time to harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Verse 4 says, Abel brought a gift, but it was the first fruits, the first portion, and the best of the lambs of his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And it says, This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. But why... What, what is the difference here? They both are bringing an offering. They're both sons of Adam and Eve. They're both in the garden. They're both communicating with the Lord. What's the difference between the two? What is it that makes the Lord accept Abel's gift and not accept Cain's gift? When we're talking about tithes and offerings and we're talking about, you know, really just giving our best to the kingdom in general, the difference between the two was that Abel brought his best. Abel bought, brought his first fruits. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse, oh, verse 9, it says, To honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Another translation says first fruits. And it says, When you do that, then your barns will be full. So what are we looking for? Bottom line is we are looking to make the Lord pleased with our life in every way. If we're going to bring an offering, and we should be, if we're going to bring our tithe, and we should be, it should be our first fruits. You know, when Monica and I, we get paid, we give digitally. A lot of times, you maybe you don't see us dropping envelopes into buckets because we give digitally. And we give digitally when we get paid. So when on payday, we have a budget that's on paper, and when that money is direct deposited into our account, we go to pay our bills. The very first thing that we do before anything else before one cent is paid out of that paycheck, the very first thing we do is we get on the church center app and we give our tithe. We give an offering. We pray over that seed. Father, thank you that you're blessing us in this area. And whatever need that we may have, we, we give this to further your kingdom. We worship you with it. Amen. Amen. It's the first fruits. And then we go down the list and we pay our bills. We're not giving God whatever's left over. Right. God's not looking for your leftovers. Right. He didn't give you his leftovers. You understand? And so what the difference between Cain and Abel was that Cain just brought what was left over. He kept the best parts for himself. God's not looking for your leftovers this morning. Amen? So again, if you're streaming with us online and you want to give into this, and you should be, if you call yourself members of this church, your tithe belongs here, go to cornerstoneofadrian.com, click on the giving tab, and, and pay that way. Or, again, the Church Center app is the best way to do it. Amen? If you're in the building, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing. Write checks to Cornerstone. And uh, now and more than ever, with all this stimulus money that's been deposited into our accounts, whether you agree with it or not, I do not. But hey, if we have it, let's use it to further the kingdom. Amen. First fruits of all of your increase. Is it increase? Yes. That means that there should be a tithe coming in on every dollar of increase into your life. Thank you, Pastor Bill, for telling us the truth and setting us free so that we can have the blessing of God in our lives. Amen. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to give into your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship in your presence, to grow from your word. And we give you thanks and praise for everything that you're going to do in this service today. Have your way. Thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Father, we're so grateful to be here this morning to worship you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are the way maker. Father, that even though our situations may not look like it, Father, that you are in control of all things. And if we trust in you and we, we surrender our lives to you, that you will do great things exceedingly abundantly. I thank you, Jesus, that you're faithful to do that. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Come on, church. Greet somebody with some love. Kids are dismissed. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, His crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive, I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman, I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat, come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. 
that is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said okay. what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable no, for what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. Good morning, Cornerstone. We are excited that you're with us today. Welcome to the dozens of you who are streaming with us today. You are glad that you're with us. Go ahead and share that page. Check in to Cornerstone. Let's spread that out as far as we can. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you today about wilderness survival. And I want to start by praying if I could. So, Father, I thank you again for the awesome opportunity to be in your house. And right now, Father, as a child of God, I begin to ask you, I ask you, Father, to, to invade this space. That, Holy Spirit, you would have your way as we bring forth your word, Lord, that you would move up and down each and every aisle that you would literally till the ground of our hearts to receive the engrafted word today. Thank you that our minds are alert and our hearts are receptive to receive everything that you have. We have come here today, sir, believing for and expecting an, exp an impartation. May we leave here different than we came in, in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, so wilderness survival, specifically talking about overcoming dry times. Amen? What is the wilderness? Wilderness, just by definition, is being in a position that you don't like. Wilderness defined as being in a place that makes it more difficult to succeed or achieve the goal that you're after. As a Christian, the wilderness is a moment where you need to use your faith to get through it. it it's a place where you, are, where, where you really have to press in to win. You ever had those moments where you're just feeling pressure on every side, where it literally just brings you to your knees. Maybe it's beside your bed or wherever you're at. Maybe it's at the altar. Maybe it's, you know, for me, it's a lot of times it's just right here in the front row through the week by myself, just me and Jesus. You ever have those moments where it's literally just brings you to your knees moment where only God can, can intervene and only God can fix what could be wrong? You got to press through to win by faith. Where you go to the next level in your life, talking about wilderness, where it's a, it's a place where you go to the next level in your life because you stood on and you spoke the word of God with faith and power. It's a time of fasting and praying. It's a time that to you seems like it's, it's, it's an uncharted or unknown area for you, but it is not an uncharted or unknown area to our God. Amen. It's not just a, a temptation moment that we go through, uh, you know, in our world almost on a daily basis. It's not just a temptation moment, but it is a place where it is literally a battle between your spirit and your flesh. A moment where you're feeling pressure all around you. It, it, in the wilderness, it's a, literally a fork in the road moment with two completely different outcomes. 
two completely different outcomes. It's a moment where you literally have to choose to keep moving forward with our God, but you're tempted to do something different. <clears throat> you ever been there? We must understand that this wilderness moment, if we don't lose our bearings, is a place where we are going to find our identity. A place where we're going to find out what we are really made of. This wilderness moment is a place where character is going to be developed and integrity is going to grow. Genesis 4, we started a little bit in offering with this, but I want to start in verse 3. Genesis 4, verse 3. Again, at harvest time, Cain presented some of his crops to the Lord. Abel brought a gift as well, the best portion of the firstborn lambs of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry. Ever been angry? You know, there's different levels of anger, right? There's, there's righteous indignation. There's, there's being angry about things that you shouldn't be angry about. There, there's levels of anger where you have to, you know, be angry and sin not. Where maybe, maybe it's a, a right reason to be angry, but you need to make sure that you don't sin in that anger. Come on. And then there's this full-blown fits of rage. Works of the flesh. This says that Ang Cain became very angry, and it says that he looked dejected. Quiet in this power pack church this morning. He looked dejected. Did you know that people on the edge of the wilderness look dejected? Here's the key. Verse 6, the, it, the Lord himself. Now listen, I, you know, in reading this, you kind of see the purpose of Cain's anger, right? He's mad at God. He's blaming God, saying, you accepted my brother's gift, but you didn't accept my gift. And so in his opinion, God's wrong, but God is not wrong. And God is fully aware of why Cain is angry. Yet in this verse, we ask him, what are you angry for? He's saying, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you so angry? This is not my fault. This is what you did. You know, in disciplining my children, a lot of times I'll ask them right before I spank their little rear ends. I said, who did this? This is not my doing. This is not my desire. I hate spanking your butts, but because I love you, I have to do this. But I want to be clear. Who did this? You did this. Your actions caused this. That's what he's saying. That's what God's saying to Cain. Why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You ever had God ask you that? Maybe we should start asking ourselves that question. Why are we so angry? Why, why is it that our countenance looks so wrinkled in this moment? Verse 7 here, again, God talking to Cain, he says, You will be accepted if you do what is right. So again, really think about this moment. He, there's a circumstance taking place that Cain does not like. And he's angry. And now he's faced with a choice. He's faced with a choice. He said, if you do what is right, you'll be accepted. But if you refuse to do what is right, watch out. You're at a fork in the road moment right here with two completely different outcomes. You better watch out. You're on the edge of the wilderness. Come on. But if you refuse to do what is right, you better watch out. Sin is crouching at the door eager to control you, but you must subdue it. You must be its master, or bottom line, it's going to master you. Watch out. You're in a moment. Be careful. You have a choice. Bottom line, in his wilderness moment, Cain lost his bearings. Cain chose to do the wrong thing. He, cur he killed his brother, and he cursed his entire bloodline. How often have we seen Christians along the way that get in these pressure wilderness, unsure moments and completely miss it. Acceptance or rejection in this moment is based on our choice. There's going to be times in our lives that are going to have the potential to cause hate in your heart towards your brothers and sisters, which includes the members of your house. 
And according to Jesus, that hate in your heart, according to Jesus in the book of Matthew, makes you equal to a murderer. Cain had a choice. And what we need to remember and what we need to fully understand about this story is that in the beginning, Cain was a good man. Cain was a good man. He, he was created by God. He was the first natural birth, the first person with a belly button. Come on. Adam and Eve didn't have them. He gets offended. I'm telling you, church, you better watch out for offense. Our enemy is crouching at the door, eager to control you. You must subdue this. The trap of the enemy is offense. And I'm telling you, your brothers and sisters will give you plenty of excuses for you to be offended. You better figure out what offense means, how dangerous it is to your life, and figure out how to, how to handle it because it is not going away. People are going to say and do some of the most bizarre things. Number one rule of ministry is people are crazy. Number two rule of ministry is I'm a people. That means today it may be you that's lost your mind and tomorrow it may be me, but we better learn how to walk together. Genesis 4, 8, talking about Cain and Abel. Cain got offended, killed his brother. Genesis 4, 8 kind of sets the stage to that. It says one day, meaning some time had passed since his conversation with God. When God said to you, if you do what's right, you're going to be accepted. But if you don't, you better watch out. So some time passes since this conversation. And Cain says to Abel, let's go out to the field. <clears throat> now, Cain was a farmer. He spent a lot of time in the field. But I'm telling you that this, this was different. This was time where Cain had spent time in the wilderness planning his brother's death. I am so mad at him. I'm going to take his very life. I'm going to bring him out to this little plot of ground right here where these little trees are, and I'm going to knock him out with a rock. Come on. He's in the wilderness, and instead of thinking about godly things, he's thinking about evil things. Sin is crouching at the door. He said, listen, if you do what's right, you're going to be accepted, but if you don't, it's going to cost you everything. This is a fork in the road moment with two completely different outcomes. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and sin not. Cain was tempted in the wilderness and failed. Come on. Genesis 4, 6, and 7 again. Why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? If you, if you just do what's right, it's going to all work out. So we're talking about overcoming these wilderness moments, overcoming these dry times, overcoming talking about how to have victory in our barren places on the way to the promised land. Deuteronomy 2.7 says, May the Lord your God bless you. Everyone say bless you. Bless you. And it didn't because you sneezed. Bless you in all the work of your hands as you trudge through what? This great Wilderness. There is a blessing that the Lord can put upon our lives if we will just do things His way, even in the midst of the wilderness. You guys out there today? So we're in this series. Thank you. As we, in this series, as we talk about this wilderness, we need to understand that this is a real place, that this is a real time in our lives. That, and it's a, it's a time and a place through which every Christian must pass through as we draw near to God. Well, that's, that's exciting, Pastor Bill. <laughs> that's dancing ground. That's shouting ground. Woo! Hallelujah. Listen, it's the facts. It's the facts. And sometimes we need to get up here and we need to just lay the truth out from the Word of God because maybe you're in a wilderness moment or you're about to go through one. But bottom line is, if there's breath in your lungs, you, you will. You will at some point in your journey, in your walk with the Lord as you're drawing near to Him. And, and again, in this time, this, in this wilderness moment, this is not a time for seeking signs and wonders, although God will give them to you. This is a time, this wilderness moment is a time to seek the heart of God. 
This wilderness moment is going to produce character on the inside of you and strength in the, in the inside of every believer. But most importantly, it is a preparation time. The wilderness is a preparation time, and if we're not careful, it will appear as a very discouraging time. Anyone who's been in a wilderness moment, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you are not careful, this is going to look like a very discouraging time. But if we will get the proper mindset, the proper perspective about this moment, it is a time of training. It is a time of preparation for the next stage of your life. If we, and listen, if we're not in the Word, if we're not listening to the Holy Ghost, if we don't have a clear vision of the promised land on the other side of this wilderness, you will fail. You will fail during this wilderness moment, and I'm here to tell you that this is just a moment. The wilderness is never the destination. It's a moment. And so again, our hope is, as we go through this, that it, it was going to bring encouragement to you. It's going to encourage you to pursue God more than ever in these moments when you do not understand what's taking place. That He alone is going to satisfy in these moments more than ever. So, you know, we're going to introduce this subject, but we're asking that our prayer is, is that you will allow room for the Holy Spirit to minister this message to you in only a way that He can. He, how to apply it to you personally, that you will let the Holy Spirit guide you through the application of this message in your life because every person's circumstances are different. I've been through some, some profound wilderness moments in my life. and you, you know, I actually listed several of them here, but I'm not even going to get into them. But bottom line is, in these wilderness moments, I found myself confronted with frustration and confusion and discouragement, great loneliness, fear, sometimes anxiety, suspicion. I mean, listen, th th there have been times that, I, that I've walked through and I have literally yelled at the top of my lungs, God, where are you? Times where I, I, have, I have literally put my hands in the air and said, God, all I've ever done is run after you with all of my heart. Why am I here? Times I have thrown my hands in the air and said, are you even watching? Only to find out that it was God leading the entire time. You know, I remember when we were going through a little transition in our life that I would actually went back to work at Adrian Steele for a while. And it just, the way it worked out, I ended up that I needed to go to second shift because of a seniority issue. It actually came down between me and another guy. Me and this other guy had hired on at the same time. We had the same level of, of seniority. And my boss came out on the floor one day, and he just said, you know, one of you two got to go to, go, gotta go to second shift because there was another guy that transferred temporarily so we could get trained that wanted to come back. And he kept telling us this for a few weeks. And so I found in the, in, in the Word, in the book of Proverbs, it says we can throw the dice, but God determines where they fall. And so I just began to trust God. Then, Lord, whatever it is, I, I know that if I trust you, that you're going to direct my steps, that you're going to guide me, you're going to direct me, you're going to keep me where I'm supposed to be. I'm trusting you, just like this, where you throw the dice, you determine where they fall. I'm trusting you that you are going to determine where my life needs to fall. And so then it came to the place where my boss come out and he said, okay, today's the day. We're going to flip a quarter. Heads or tails, one of you are going. And he pointed at me, he said, what do you call? And I literally looked him in the eye in front of everyone, and I said, the Bible says, I am the head and not the tail, and so I call heads. He flipped it, and it was tails. And I literally walked away from that moment with my hands in the air, and literally, 10 feet from my supervisor, and everybody watched it with my hands in the air. Are you even watching? But as a result of going to second shift, we started this church. So in a moment where I completely did not understand what God was doing, 
He was guiding the entire time. That's what we need to get out of this today. We need to realize, like I did, I found myself in a place where I, where I realized that this, this wilderness moment is not your destination. It's a place where we need to cry out to our God, where, where we ask Him to fix our heart, where we ask Him to purify our motives, where we ask Him to, to deal with and cleanse us of the hidden sins in our lives, to remove every hindrance that's keeping us from God's glory. And here's the key. I did not expect this wilderness moment that the Lord brought me through and used to change my life. I didn't expect it. And so again, this wilderness moment is not your final destination. And let, let's be clear about this. Just because you come out of one wilderness moment does not mean that you've obtained everything that God has in store for you. <laughs> Meaning that there's probably going to be several sifting moments in our lifetime in our walk with God. And if we're not quick to learn on the first trip around the mountain, we're probably going to be repeating some processes. <laughs> so my encouragement and my prayer is that you learn quick. And so again, as we go through this, we're praying that you find the strength and you find the courage to press in, that your faith would literally fail not, as Jesus said to Peter in his sifting moment, that you would fulfill your God-given destiny in your life. And what you need to know is that there's an understanding that you can reach. There's a, a position that you can obtain, a proper perspective to gain in our minds where you understand that God is working in your life even though you may not be feeling his touch. Come on. This is a moment, this wilderness moment is a time where your heart will fall more in love with God, a place where you mature beyond the place of what can God do for me to what does God desire of me. <clears throat> Maybe you can relate. I, I recall that, you know, when I first got saved, I can remember, it seemed like all I had to do was just whisper God's voice and had an immediate manifestation of his presence in my life. You ever been in a place in your walk with, with the Lord where you, <clears throat> you just desired more of Him? You, you were seeking after Him, but you felt perplexed and confused and found, felt like you just couldn't find Him. It felt like every time you prayed, your, your prayers fell flat, where you were just literally wondering, where are you, God? Where are you, God, in this moment? Job 23, 8 and 9 says, I go to the east, but He's not there. I go to the west, I can't find him. I do not see him in the north because he is hidden. I look to the south, he is concealed. You ever been in this place where all you wanted was God and felt like you couldn't find him? Please speak to me. And all you hear is silence. Maybe like Job, you feel like you're turning in every direction and you can't find him. You're seeking him, but you don't see him or his workings in your life. Maybe you've been there, maybe you're there now, and I'm just saying, welcome to the wilderness. So I want to encourage you that in this place that you're not alone, that in fact you're walking in a place where the, you're in good company. You're in good company. You're walking in a place where Moses walked. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's courts as a prince, and he ended up on the backside of the desert for 40 years tending sheep. His wilderness moment right before fulfilling his destiny. What about Joseph? Joseph was a highly favored son of Jacob who had dreams of leaderships and achievements only to be thrown into a prison, sold as a slave, locked up in bars, thrown into a pit. Look at his life. He had major wilderness moments right before fulfilling his destiny. Job we've talked about, but the Bible says that Job was a man in his time. The Bible describes him as the greatest man of all yet lost his possessions, lost his children, lost his health, lost the support of his wife all in one, one moment, a wilderness moment right before fulfilling his destiny. More importantly, you're in the company of the Son of God. Jesus himself was baptized and then immediately led into the wilderness by the Spirit. 
compelled to face the forces of darkness. Are you seeing a pattern? Are you seeing a pattern? The list of wilderness travelers is long, but we must understand the wilderness is a necessary season in the life of every child of God. And of course, every one of us wants to bypass this moment. Every one of us are looking for a shortcut. Everyone wants a detour, but bottom line is there is only one route to our promised land. And it will not be obtained without passing through this wilderness. So with that being said, we need to understand this, this time. We need an understanding of this season and this moment that we're going to go to. It is imperative to our victory to make it to our promised land that we understand the times that we are in. First Chronicles, we see some men joining David at Ziklag. They're warriors who fought beside David in, in a lot of battles. They were expert archers who could shoot arrows and sling stones with their left hand as well as the right hand. They were, they were experts with the shield and spear. The Bible says that they were fierce as lions and swift as deers on the mountain edge. And it says the weakest of them could defeat a hundred all by themselves. These are warriors. And of these men, 1 Chronicles 12.32 says 200 of these men from Issachar all understood the signs of the times and knew the best course to take for Israel. Because they understood the timing of God, because they understood the seasons that we go through, they could lead Israel to victory. As believers, we must understand the times and the seasons and the moments that we are, that we are in. We must understand that the Holy Spirit knows exactly where God is trying to lead us. He knows what God is trying to accomplish. And if we will listen closely and respond wisely, that we can have victory in our wilderness moments. On the other hand, without understanding of where God wants to go, we're going to find ourselves falling short and going around the same mountains again and again. Luke 12, 54 says, Jesus turned to the crowd and, and said to them, when you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you're right. 55 says, when the south wind blows, you say, today's going to be a scorcher. You're right. 56, you fools. You know how to interpret the weather. You know how to interpret the signs in the sky, in the earth, but you do not know how to interpret the signs of the times. Listen, we can't be foolish. We can't be foolish. We must understand the seasons. Can a farmer plant during harvest season? The answer is no. And equally true, if he doesn't plant in the right season, he's not going to reap at harvest season either. Planting in the correct time is crucial. If he plants too early or too late, the crops are not going to yield like they should, like God intended. That seed needs to be in the proper position at the right time. And so a farmer must thoroughly understand the timing of sowing and reaping if he's going to be successful. So we must understand the signs of the times. The moments that we are in. We must understand that in the church today, we are in a season of preparation. Let me say that again. We're in the season of preparation for the coming harvest. And in order for us to fully reap, we need to recognize this season. We must understand the process that God is trying to bring us through, that God is preparing you for harvest. That means he needs to till the ground. That means he needs to pull out the weeds. That means he needs to plant some seeds. That means you are currently in a season of pruning and grafting and sifting but like Moses and like Job and like Jesus, this wilderness moment is all right before fulfilling our destiny. It's in this wilderness season that we're going to develop the character and the integrity and the tools where the equipping takes place for the next stage of our lives that God has in store. There's a harvest season God is trying to get us to, but there's preparation that must take place. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2 says, To everything there is a season, 
There is a time for every purpose under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest. And so we're working to create an understanding of the seasons, what season we are in, how crucial they are, what is their purpose, and more importantly, being in the right mindset during these seasons. Again, this season we are in is a time of pruning, and its purpose is preparation for harvest. Preparation for harvest. The wilderness moments, there will be wilderness moments along the way to our promised land. We need to understand this. And the wilderness should not be a negative time in any way for any person who is obeying God. The wilderness moment should not be negative for those who are obeying God. We can't lose our bearings during this time. Again, it's, it's supposed to be positive. It's meant to train us and to prepare us, to equip us for a fresh move of the Holy Ghost, not only in our lives, but in this church and in this city. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed because they reject Knowledge. May it not be so in this house. We can't reject knowledge and expect to win. Many people are falling away because they refuse to get wisdom, and because they don't have wisdom, they enter into these wilderness moments without knowledge. And they begin to behave without wisdom because they don't understand what's taking place in their lives. And so they begin to search in all the wrong places and they find themselves around the wrong people at the wrong time doing the wrong things. They don't like the pressure of this season and so they're looking for an escape route. And unwittingly they are prolonging their wilderness journey. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You ever been in a place or ever heard someone say, why does it feel like I keep going around this mountain? And the answer is because you didn't learn the first time. <laughs> Without understanding of the seasons that we're going to go through, you're going to experience hardship. You're going to experience frustration and even defeat because you do not understand where God is trying to lead you. You see in this? This was the case with the children of Israel. They lacked understanding. They lacked understanding of what the wilderness was supposed to be in their lives. And it caused an entire generation to be unfit to enter in and possess the promised land that God intended for them. God's purpose was to lead them through the wilderness to test them, to train them, and to prepare them. He was looking for sanctified warriors to go in and possess the promised land. Instead, Israel perceived the wilderness as punishment. They murmured, and they complained, and they lusted for things that they did not have. And as a result, they, listen, they even desired to go back into slavery. Exodus 14, 12 says, It'd be better that we were slaves in Egypt than corpse in the wilderness. Where were they? In the wilderness. Losing their minds. <laughs> when it came time to leave the wilderness and occupy and conquer the promised land, they, tr they decided to trust misguided men's opinions. They trusted the report of complainers, had the choice between God's promises and God's ability, and chose man in all of their inability. And so instead of, I mean, think about this. They're literally on the edge of the promised land where they can see greatness. And they choose to go back into the wilderness. I'm telling you today, we better pay very close attention to where they missed it. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says that these things have happened to them, talking about Israel, as examples for us that they were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. That's us. They were wrote down 
These stories were wrote down so that we wouldn't fall into the same traps that they did. We better wake up. We better see where they missed it. We better learn from their mistakes. Listen, their ignorance, which means lack of knowledge, their ignorance of God's nature and God's character and God's plan caused them to act wickedly, and what was supposed to be a brief journey in the wilderness became a lifetime experience for these men and women. They died in the very thing that was meant to only train them. James 1 and 2 says, Brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Those with understanding, those with wisdom, will enter wilderness moments with joy. Knowing what has taken place and knowing that beyond this wilderness moment is a promised land. Those with understanding, those with wisdom, enter wilderness moments with joy because they understand there is an equipping taking place. That means I'm lacking something that I need for my destiny. And although this is going to be some work, I'm going to come out ripped on the other side. Come on. And I'm telling you that this joy that we're talking about is going to be the strength that gets you through the wilderness. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Now is not the time for sorrow. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He's saying that to returning exiles who are trying to rebuild the temple. The joy of the Lord is your strength. They were going through a battle. They were going through a rebuilding time. God's desire is to create able vessels. People who are ready and been equipped for a fresh move of the Holy Ghost. People who have a willing heart. Not only knowledge of His will, but a willing heart to do it. Isaiah 119 says, If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Two keys here. I'm saying three because you've got to be knowledgeable of His will. <laughs> you have to be willing and you have to be obedient. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about what is the wilderness, what the wilderness is not, what is its purpose, what is its benefits. And again, my prayer is as we get this instruction from this Word and with the help of the leading of the Holy Ghost that we will learn to walk wisely through these seasons. Whether you're in, in it now or you're equipping for something you may be walking through later, we must understand this wilderness time is not a time of punishment and it is not a time of disapproval. As we lay this foundation, obviously we need to look to Jesus as the example, the one who successfully completed his wilderness training. Right? Right? led there by the Holy Ghost right before starting His ministry and fulfilling His destiny. Luke 3.21 says, When the people were being baptized, it came to pass Jesus was baptized. And while He prayed, the heaven was open. 22 says, The Holy Spirit descended on Him in a bodily form. And a voice from heaven came, saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So not only is God proclaiming that Jesus Christ is His Son to everyone around, but he is announcing that he is completely approving of what Jesus is, does, and says. In verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, right after this moment, it says, Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by God. Into the wilderness. And verse 4 says to be tempted, to be tested, to be tried for 40 days. And so these passages should make it abundantly clear that the reason for being led into the wilderness has nothing to do with disapproval or punishment. God said, in whom I am well pleased. Right before leading him there. It's important to be clear right in the beginning of this thing that that question is settled in our minds once and for all. The wilderness is not punishment. Another point that must be clear is that God didn't bring you into the wilderness to abandon you. He didn't bring you into the wilderness to give you over to the enemy's devices. He didn't bring you into the wilderness to forget about you. Settle it once and for all. Let's go to Deuteronomy 8.2. 
Look at God's exhortation to the second generation of Israel right before they entered their promised land. He says, remember, the Lord led you all the way these 40 years, where? In the wilderness. The Lord led you in the wilderness. For what? To humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, and whether or not you would do what I say. That's pretty profound. Come on. Again, he's talking to the second generation of Israel who's about to enter into Canaan land. He's telling them the purpose of their wilderness. And how to overcome that wilderness. He's saying you need to remember. Remember what? Remember where your parents missed it. Remember that I'm leading you. Remember that with me you win. We need to understand, and we sang about it this morning, that no matter the season we are in, the Lord never stops working. Even when I don't see you, I know you're working. He leads us through these moments, not abandons us to them. Psalms 23, 4 says, Though I walk through, I'm saying the wilderness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Without God, we would never make it through. And we need to understand, again, that this wilderness is not a place where God puts us on the shelf until He's ready to use us. That's not the point. That's not the purpose. That's not the way our God operates. God loves us, and contrary, it is a place where God works mightily to change you. You've heard the phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> the wilderness is a lot like that. It's difficult to see God moving in the midst of it, but again I say, God never stops working. Let's be clear. The wilderness is never a time of defeat. Again, for those who are obeying God. Jesus wasn't defeated in his wilderness moment. We see he's physically weak. He's, he's hungry. He has no human to confide in. There's, there's no human cheering him on. He has no encouragement, no physical comfort, no supernatural manifestation. For 40 days, he is under attack by our enemy in the wilderness, and Jesus won. Jesus defeated our enemy by speaking the word. The wilderness is never meant to be a time of defeat for God's children. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And don't forget the next two words, in Christ. We like to quote this verse, God always leads us in triumph, but don't forget the rest of it. In Christ. While Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they were harassed by the surrounding nations. And the Lord told them, fight back. Fight back. Defeat their enemies. They walked in victory through the wilderness all the way to the promised land. Numbers 21, 23, we see they defeated the Ammonites in the wilderness. Sion wouldn't allow Israel to pass through the territory, so he gathered all his people against Israel in the wilderness. And verse 24 says, Israel defeated them, all of them, with the edge of their sword. In the wilderness they had victory. Israel defeated Bashan. Numbers 21.33 says, Og, the king of Bashan, went out against Israel with all of his people. And verse 35 says that Israel defeated him, his sons, all their people, not one survivor. In the wilderness, they had victory. Israel defeated the Midianites in the wilderness, according to Numbers 31.7. That the Midianites, they attacked the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the men. And verse 10 says, they burned the towns, the villages, and took all the plunder. In the wilderness, they walked in victory. It was not God's purpose for them to experience defeat. They were winning as long as they were doing it God's way. And the moment they got to the edge of the promised land and stopped doing it God's way, they lost. Because of their disobedience. Sad, but true. In closing, we have laid a good foundation 
about the wilderness. We hope that the things that we've said today has settled some things in your heart. That again, the wilderness is not a time of disapproval. It's not a time of punishment. It's not a time where God puts you on the shelf. Let's be clear. The wilderness is not a time where God is mad at you. It's not a place where He abandons you or forgets about you, but clearly the wilderness is a time of victory, is a time of equipping, is a time where our character is going to be developed, and it is the place where success begins. <laughs> and so if we will believe and we will trust, and we will obey what God is trying to do in our lives, we will win, and we will come out equipped for the bright future that He has in store. You receive it today? Master, I love you, and I thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. Father, thank you for this moment in this session, in this sanctuary right now, Father, where we have begun to, to lay the foundation blocks for a very important message. As we go through this series, Father, I pray that you equip these people with every tool that they need to win. To not only succeed through the wilderness moment, Father, but to understand what it is and to actually win. To actually be equipped through these moments so that they can literally fulfill their destinies. Father, you have a plan. You have a plan. And there's things about us that need to be changed in order to fulfill that plan. May we allow you to mold us and shape us in every way that you see fit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Call you blessed.